رحم الله من قرا الفاتحه اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق اجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين مولانا وسيدنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين المذلومين الهداة المهديين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض أرواحنا له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائه مجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في قرآنه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers, sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Yesterday we had uh, discussed our first part of the discussion on the hereafter. We began by signaling the end of the period of Barzakh, which is وَيَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي السُّورِ When the trumpet is announced, when the trumpet is announced and blown, that will herald the end of the period of Barzakh. Then we discussed a number of cosmological physical changes that will occur the world will change the the appearance of the world will change the mountains will disappear the sun will go the stars will fade people will die and during this death the whole universe will change then they will be brought back to life upon being brought back to life many people will be in a state of bewilderment they won't know what's going on. They won't be able to comprehend that, wow, we were asleep for a while and we have been brought back to life. But Allah does this as we discussed from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That the earth will consume the entire body of a person except for a tiny part of his spinal column which Allah will use that to resurrect and recreate this human being we discussed the sixth imams hadith regarding the reign of qiyamah that it will rain for 40 days of whatever 40 days that will be we don't know the exact duration and from that the earth will be able to almost regrow these human beings we discuss then when we emerge from these graves and we open our eyes, we'll see a new world around us. But we'll see people of different shapes and sizes depending on their deeds and their sins. We discuss 10 of these of different, some animalistic, some human, but strange and changed. Then we stopped at this point where we said we will pick up today, which is now the journey begins. Now, what is this journey? Let us discuss this now with Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <coughs> now the journey begins from the moment of resurrection to the end of our eventual abode. What is this journey? How does it work? The journey is physical in one sense, like we do move from place to place. But more fundamental than this and more profound than this is the journey within the soul. Because Jannat, heaven, it's not possible to enter heaven whilst a human soul has any form of pollution, sin, rancor, disagreement, 
negativity, none of this is allowed to enter heaven. So a human being who arrives at heaven with these things, he's not allowed entry. And he is sorted out much more earlier than this. He's not even allowed to get to the approach to heaven. We will discuss this. So what will happen is that after we are raised, there is a number of processes that will get us to our final abode. The first thing is that many people will not know what's going on. And we will hear something on, the day of, on, on that time of resurrection, which will be whispers. What are these whispers? These are whispers, these billions and trillions of people who have emerged from their graves, will now, the Quran says, begin to whisper one, to one another because they're terrified. What's going on? What's happening? Where are we? Where are we going? Quran references this. It says that some people will be raised, they'll be whispering, they'll be asking, where are those people that used to tell us about this day? Let's go and find them and ask them. They will be desperate for news. Some people will be very blessed. And what they will do is when they realize what has happened, almost immediately they will raise a slogan. Their slogan will be La ilaha illallah wa alayhi tawakkalna. There is no God but God and upon Him do we rely. Where is this slogan coming from? It is from their hearts. So what it means is that in this world they had this slogan. In this world they realized that they had to trust Allah. In this world they had the appreciation of tawakkul upon Allah. On Allah so in that world it comes back to them and they are very blessed because now they realize that they can trust Allah even in this time and place of day of judgment they can trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then we have hashr and jama hashr means bringing together a gathering and jama means assembly so there'll be a huge gathering of all peoples and an assembly all the people of history will be gathered different times different ages different genders they will be gathered in one place and then they will be herded into different sections these sections are based on what type of soul quality of soul and the angels will direct this and people will have nothing to say they will immediately realize that yes this is my group they will feel a sense of belonging in that they, they will understand that yes actually we do belong in this group they won't say oh I wish I was in that group or I want to go there no no one will be allowed to mess up with the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so now there will be different paths and different areas depending on how we lived our lives we will be guided by the angels the angels will be able to see inside us and recognize what we really are and it will be very efficient, very quick and very quiet. The day when they emerge from the graves, hastening as if racing towards a target. Quran says. Now, what if I'm in one group, my son, my wife, my father, my mother is in another group. What will I do? Believe me, we'll be so concerned about ourselves, we won't have time to worry about anyone else. The terror and the seriousness of that moment will overtake us. So we will be oblivious to the plight of others. For some, this whole process will be terrifying. For others, it will be very pleasurable because they are in the company of good people. Now, the journey begins. This journey is all about accounting and summarizing and categorizing our deeds. Our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam said, Allah Regarding this moment, because from now it's going to be accounting. He says, beware, evaluate your deeds before they are evaluated for you. Us businessmen, what we say is, better to do your tax return rather than have the taxman do it for you. 
isn't it? We know this. It can be painful. Same principle. Better you account for yourselves now than the accounting is done for you at a much stricter level. He goes on. He says, because Qiyama has 50 stations, each of which will be 1,000 of your years in duration. How is it possible? We can't even fathom 50,000 years. We live barely 50, 60, 70, 80 years. No, this is required because of the depth of the human being and the complexity of the human soul. Such a level of depth may be required for people to delve into them, to find out what's going on, to see how they can be modified and remedied. Now, there are a number of people that will be walking in complete darkness. We must understand that when we talk about darkness and light, we're not talking about the same kind of concept in this world. For example, if I'm walking and there's light upon me and someone is walking next to me, the light will also go on that person because they're with me. In the hereafter, no. In the hereafter, it could be two people walking side by side, one in complete light and one in complete darkness. It's not like this world where the sun shines and it illuminates everything. So some people will be in darkness and some people will be in light. What is the criteria for darkness and light? If the fundamental truths, Allah, the way He is, Ma'rifat of Allah, recognition of Allah, awareness of God. If these have been absorbed properly, that person will have light on the Day of Judgment. If however, okay, we listen to Majalis, we learn some things in our childhood, we never really understood them properly, and we said, okay, never mind, let's go on, we'll see at the end of the day what happens. We took it very lightly. We didn't work on our souls. Well, these things haven't been absorbed properly. So it could be that on that day of judgment, we are in darkness. Because what we have learned is theoretical and not really spiritual. And without ma'rifat of Allah, entry into heaven becomes impossible. This is a fundamental thing that I want us all to realize. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Without ma'rifat of Allah, entry into heaven is impossible. Because heaven itself, the whole premise of heaven, everything in heaven is linked to ma'rifat of Allah. Now how can someone enter something without the quality needed to enter? It's like the key of heaven. You can't enter without this key. Will people be able to gain ma'rifat of Allah after death? Possibly. In certain cir circumstances, possibly. But it will be much easier and much better if we gain it here before we die. So what happens is, I'm going to now describe some of the stations. We have, as the sixth Imam said, 50 stations. We don't know most of them. They haven't been mentioned or they're not clear for us. So I will mention some of those that we know of that have been described. One is the station which is called the opening of the books. You'll see a reference to this in many places in du'as. In du'as you will see that the Imams have mentioned, Oh Allah, bless me or help me or assist me at the time of opening of the books. This is a fundamental station of the hereafter. So what if you remember during Barzakh, what Ruman had forced us to open and examine, and that has been absorbed into our being, that will then come out and that will be forced open. All of the deeds, all of the conduct, all of the thoughts, the feelings, the beliefs, now they will no longer remain as words. Now the book will actually become like a series of images and concepts. Now these things will no longer remain just in written form. They actually acquire forms in themselves. This is the higher realm of the hereafter. Remember, world is all about physical objects. 
Barzakh was like about concepts. Hereafter is even more. It's when spiritual things take their forms. For example, we have one hadith regarding Surah Al-Hamd. That the person who recites Surah Al-Hamd on the Day of Judgment, that Surah Al-Hamd will appear to that person in a glowing, wonderful, illuminated presence. And he will come and he'll say, I'm here to help you. He'll say, what are you? You look amazing. He said, I'm that simple Surah Al-Hamd that you had recited, which took you less than 30 seconds. I'm here to help you. Second station that I want to mention. It is when the actions that we have performed will be displayed in front of Allah. That is going to be very difficult. That station is going to be very difficult. Walau tara idil mujrimuna nakisu ru'usihim. This is really difficult even for me to recite. And if only you could see when those who did wrong, the corrupt ones, the mujrimun, the way their necks will be bowed down in shame. In the Rabbihim, in front of their Lord. Rabbana absarna wa sami'na farji'na na'mal salihan. Oh Allah, now we understand. Now we can see. Now we can hear all these truths. In the world we chose not to see. We turned our eyes. We blocked our ears. Farji'na. Can you please send us back? We don't want to be here. We're not ready. Send us back. Na'amal salihan. We will do good deeds now. Give us a chance. Can't you turn back the clock? Can't you turn back this eons of change of the universe? Can't you send us back into our lives? We'll be good now, really. You know, like children do. Don't punish me, please. I'll be good from now on. Well, that is what some people will be like on the Day of Judgment. Inna muqinun. Now we have yaqeen. Now we are sure. Sorry, too late. There's no going back. It is reported regarding Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Whenever he would think of this station of the deeds being opened in front of God, he would sigh and sometimes fall unconscious. Some people will still, you, you know, it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. You know stubborn people, right? You all know stubborn people. Maybe we are stubborn, we don't know. Maybe people are thinking that we are the stubborn ones. But we all know stubborn people. Difficult to get through to them. Very difficult to reason with them. Very difficult to have debates with them. On the Day of Judgment, some people's stubbornness will be so deep that it will still manifest at this station. So some people will still try to argue with God. No Allah, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. This is wrong. There's a mistake here. Someone has filed the entry in the wrong book. Some people will dispute. Some people will deny. Some people will give excuses. Some people, you know what they'll try to do? They'll try to take the book off their own neck and put it on someone else's neck. This is ridiculous, but it makes us laugh. But this is what I'm trying to say, that in this world, if you are like, you know, a stubborn person, you don't want to listen to anyone's wisdom or wise words. Well, these things are very deep. And in the Day of Judgment, they will come out and you will feel them there. Once everyone has been given their deed, scroll of deeds, they're satisfied that it is accurate. It has been presented in front of Allah. Then it will be rolled up again and given back to him. Either in the right hand or the left hand. We pray to Allah we are given in the right hand. Look at Surah Al-Waqiyah. It summarizes these three groups. As-sabiqoon, as-sabiqoon, ula'ika humul muqarrabun. If we are in this group, then really, job done, sorted. We don't need to worry about anything. If we are in the muqarrabun, Allah, it's amazing. They are the choicest, closest ones to Allah. Then we'll have the Ashabul Yameen. Okay, they were also very good. And then we'll have the Ashabul Shimal, the left hand group. We don't want to be there. And there are other subgroups as well. 
then we have the station of the witnesses salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad some people like i said they will still be because they were habitual liars in this world they will still be trying to argue with allah and they will still be trying to make excuses so allah in the next station he'll bring a group of people known as shuhada shuhada has two meanings in arabic one is martyrs what is the other meaning witness the, he will bring witnesses witnesses these are people whom allah has granted so much honor and authority that on the day of judgment they can actually witness against these people who are standing in front of allah and when they speak everything will become quiet and their testimony will be taken as truth who are these people well these are the amazing personalities through history and in our time it is none other than our beloved imam imam e zamana ajal allah ta'ala farajahu sharif now in qiyamah one of the key things is that conceptually goodness and evil goodness and evil cannot coexist in qiyamah there is a line drawn either you are on one path or you're on the other path here there is no more in between now you are sorted properly there is no chance that good and evil can exist together so the books are now stored in two places the storage rooms of the akhirat sijin is one this is for the evil records the books which are full of sin full of vice they are stored in sijin and then we have illiyin the books of the righteous are stored in illiyin these are the qiyamati concepts of what these books contain there's also one in the person themselves as their record and there's one in the record of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now the right and the left hand we don't know exactly what this means surely it doesn't mean physically right and left but we have some hints from the holy quran for example the following ya ayyuhal insan innaka kadihun ila rabbik kadhan fa mulaqi o oh man you are laboring towards your lord laboriously but you will encounter him you will meet him then as for him who shall be given his record in his right hand he shall soon receive an easy reckoning so ashabul yameen will have a relatively simple and easy reckoning and he shall return to his folks joyfully but as for one who is given his record from behind his back he will pray for annihilation and he will enter the blazing fire so there are different ways that the book will be given what this exactly means it's difficult to say for sure but we know that there will be different groups the books will be given in different ways and people at the end of the day will be sorted into one group or the other then we have the very difficult station the station of accounting hisab Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is really interesting. What will happen is everyone will be judged simultaneously but yet everyone will feel like they are being judged individually. It's wonderful. The way our Lord is is just mind-boggling. Can you find a parallel anywhere regarding this? Where everyone is judged simultaneously or dealt with simultaneously but we feel individually my lord is with me? Hajj maybe. Well, here now. Right now every day every time we all know that Allah is dealing with everyone at the same time but we all feel that his 
nazar, his look, his glance, his attention is on me. There's a lovely thing which one of the scholars had said. He said, Allah has so many creatures but he treats every one of them as if they are his only creature. And insan has only one God, but he treats that one God as if he has many gods. It's very disturbing. The way we treat Allah is so unfair. My teacher used to say, Allah, he hasn't created us like a conveyor belt of laptops and smartphones that one after the other they're all the same each one of us has an individual unique personality and he deals with us in that way that's his mercy so on the day of judgment exactly the same we will feel as if each of us individually is getting a private hearing but really he's dealing with everyone simultaneously the most precious thing at this time what we will be relying on and what we will be banking on is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy of Allah, the mercy of Allah. We will be so much in need of it at this moment. Because quite simply, to tell you the truth, to be very blunt, we don't really deserve what He's giving us in terms of reward. If you think about it, why should He reward us? We really are doing nothing other if we worship Him, Many of us don't even worship him. But if we do worship him, really this is nothing other than paying him back for what he's actually done for us. Usually, you don't reward someone in that situation. Take a child. If a child does something in the household for his parents, usually for children we think, well, so what? You should do it. You're part of the family. You're part of the household. It's your thing anyway. We've done so much for you, it's time you did something for us. But Allah, no. He says, although all of that is true, I will still reward you abundantly. So the mercy of Allah will be very, very special at this point. Now, what happens thereafter is greatly dependent upon what happens in this station. A true believer will leave this station of accounting full of joy. His qiyamati forms of deeds have multiplied. Allah has been gracious. Allah said, you did this much, I'm going to give you this much. You spent one rupee in my way, I'm going to give you a thousand sawab. You helped one person, I'm going to reward you like you rewarded a thousand people. You took one step towards the mosque, I'll pretend that it was a hundred steps. You kept one fast, this much reward. You prayed one Ziyat Ashura, thousand Hajj. You went to Karbala, million Hajj for example. Here his grace will just be flowing. Why? Because now the Mu'min, the true Mu'min, his heart has been opened and he's able to receive the grace of God. Whereas the non-Mu'min will struggle. His heart is still closed, still dark. Even if Allah wants to give him, he can't accept. His form won't let him accept. Take a bucket right now, put it outside, turn it upside down. Is any water going to penetrate? How come? But it's raining so much. You'll say, well, whatever, the bucket is the wrong way. It's not the rain's fault, it's the bucket's fault. The same on that day. If we are like closed and there's no way to penetrate, Allah cannot give His grace. We don't qualify for it. We're not in the right form for it. So for the wrongdoers, it's going to be very painful. They may not be forgiven. They will be intensely scrutinized. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Our sixth Imam was asked about the famous verse of the Quran. Quran mentions one thing that when you see it, first of all, it raises a question in the mind. Allah says that some people will be given su'ul hisab, an evil reckoning. The question comes, what do you mean evil? How can Allah do something evil? Allah will do the reckoning. So how will hisab from God be evil? 
So this question was asked to Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. He said, it means the minute scrutiny and detailed examination of every single deed. You think about your deeds and you think if someone was to take a magnifying glass and scrutinize every second of your deed, what was your niyat? What was going through your heart? What did you intend? What did you want? Did you realize someone was watching you? Did you make your deed better because they were watching you? Did you think in the back of your mind, wow, if people knew how good I was, what would they think of me? Every millisecond will be scrutinized. It's very difficult. Their evil acts are counted against them while their good acts are not accepted from them. Some people were saying, some people have asked me, but what if someone does good? Will it go to waste? Not necessarily, but as we said, in Qiyamat, there's going to be a line drawn. How much goodness? Can your goodness overpower your evil? Or is your evil too great and it's overpowering your goodness? So, his detailed accounting means that all his good acts will be revealed as actually not very good. And they will not count in his favor and everything will be summarized as evil because they are not enough of that to separate him from the evil group. So either good will overtake evil or evil will overtake good but both cannot exist in one person at that time. Then we have the station of what we call Mizan scales. You've heard of this station, yeah? Mizan, the weighing scales. The weighing scales, in this world, we think of it as two equal pans. You put a weight here, you put a commodity here, you weigh it and you find how much it is. Not in the life hereafter. In the life hereafter, it doesn't look like there's this kind of scale of two pans. Not that. It looks like there is one scale that measures your deeds. Now the question is, measures what? It measures what? The weight? Well, there's no weight because it's not a physical world. So what is it measuring? What do you think? What will Allah be measuring in the deeds? Khulus. Khulus. Khulus is sincerity. Someone else said something. Marifat, Khulus, all of this can be summarized with one word that the Holy Quran use, uses. Wal waznu yawmaidin al haq. How much haq was in your deeds? This can all be translated as Khulus, Marifat, Niyat, whatever. But haq, how much truth? was in your deeds. Now, it will not be surprising that someone comes with a mountain of deeds but little truth. That will be very light. Despite the mountain of deed, it doesn't matter. The wasn is haq. It could be someone comes with relatively less deeds but haq is more. So the scale is heavier. This is why we say again and again and again, doing deeds is wonderful. The more you do, inshallah, the better. But make sure you follow Amir al muminin Ali alayhi salam's advice. <laughs> Amir al muminin says, خلص amal." Make your amal sincere. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about how much people will admire you and your reputation and your deeds. Don't worry about things being announced about you. Don't worry about a plaque being put on the wall with your name. Don't worry about your name being mentioned as one of the donors or volunteers. No. In fact, you know what, let me tell you, I'll share with you a few things that I've noticed in my humble experience. You know our ulama, God bless them. God bless them. We owe them a lot. They've taught us a lot. They've taught us one thing in particular. 
ulama hate when their names are mentioned and a lot of fuss is made about them they don't like it we have a wrong concept we think oh ulama you know they need a lot of respect a lot of name a lot of reputation we should mention them we should give them izzat we should give them honor yes you should from your side because you want to honor knowledge fine but they don't really thrive on this you know some people may Allah forgive them I'm sure they're good people but they have a wrong concept I've heard them myself they say for example they would ask me a question okay they would ask me a question they would send me a question and say is this halal haram jai is what and I would say I'm sorry this is haram so you know the best thing that they do our community mashallah is expert in this yeah you they ask you a question you give them an answer they don't like the answer what do they say I think you have misunderstood the question no bro I haven't misunderstood I understand English he'll send it in a different way <laughs> okay still haram different way still haram different way bro still haram sorry man what can I do some people you know what they've said to me we will go and ask Agha Sistani ourselves Bismillah do it some people say we will go with so much combs and we will ask this question Astaghfirullah as if this combs is going to bend Agha's fatwa towards you don't give your combs Agha will say Alhamdulillah I don't have this burden on me tell Agha, Agha I'm not gonna do your taqlid anymore he'll say okay one less person I have to account for we don't understand so the khulus and sincerity which we are looking for in the deeds is very difficult that's why in the majority of cases we are taught that when you do any good deed most of the time try and hide it so charity if you want to give charity most of the time you hide it there are some occasions when you should give charity for people to see when when are the times when you can give charity for people to see Yeah, so that they can be encouraged. That's fine. But then you have to have a really careful niyat. But yes, sometimes let's say 10, 20%, give it openly so people can see and they can say, you know what, actually he is giving, I can give as well. But majority hidden. Namaz e Shab, generally speaking, hidden. Namaz e Jamaat, wajib namaz, in front of everyone to encourage, to show it's important. Hajj in front of everyone. Generosity, these things hidden as much as why? To keep the niyat khalis, kulus, mukhlis, ikhlas, all of these similar meanings. Sincerity of action is very, very important. So they will measure, Allah will measure, the angels will measure these deeds upon the mizan of haqq. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, there is one category of people who will not have any weight, will not have any weighing on the scales. These are the people whose evil was to such an extent that they actually have nothing to present on that day there will be some they will not have anything to present because even if they did any good it was consumed some deeds are like this when you do them yes they are written for you as good deeds but then your bad deeds efface them they get rid of them there's a hadith the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said to his companions whoever recites La ilaha illallah trees are planted for him in Jannat so one companion said oh in that case I must have lots and lots of trees because I recite it all the time 
He said, yes, but be very careful not to set fire to the trees. He said, how do we set fire to the trees? He says, by saying lies, gibbet, gossip and these things, you are annihilating those trees that you have planted. So some things will efface other things. Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ They are people who deny the signs of their Lord, so their works have failed. فَحَبِتَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ Their deeds are nullified. They have nothing to show. فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا On the day of judgment, no weight will be for them. Then we have the station of Sirat. Sirat, how do we say it in English? What will we say? Path. Bridge, path, all of these things. At the end of Sirat, we know where we are going. If we cross Sirat, that is heaven. If we do not cross Sirat, we will fall. There will be hellfire waiting. Sirat itself is a very complicated matter. For most people, so far, they have not been able to be categorized properly. Every station has given them some kind of challenge. And now they arrive at Sirat. Now on Sirat, there is a great chance that through the individual questioning of deeds, they will be able to proceed where they need to go. Entry into paradise, like I've said, requires all traces of pollution to be removed and the person should be purified. The Sirat helps for this to happen. Now, this Sirat, some people will cross it like a bolt of lightning, like the speed of light. Some people will cross it like a galloping horse. Some people will run, some people will walk, some people will crawl, some people will go on their fronts, some people will never cross. This is the spectrum of different experiences on Sirat. Why? What is the key here? What will determine these things, whether you go fast or slow? Sin, sins, yes. Deeds, sins. Sirat has a parallel in this world. What is the Sirat in this world? I guarantee you, you mention it every day a number of times. Ihdinas Sirat al Mustaqeem. O Allah, guide us towards the straight path. If your path here was straight, your path there will be straight. If here you had a relatively simple life, you understood concepts, you brought them into your heart, you had yaqeen, you followed the teachings, your path will be straight. That is the straight path. If not, if you had lots of issues and turns and twists and stubbornness and Argumentation for the sake of argumentation, not argumentation to learn, but for the sake of argumentation, again and again, same thing until you're old and grey. What do you think? Is that a straight path? Probably not. Allah knows every individual. But probably this person is going to have problems. Because at the end of the day, let me share with you something which is the most simplest thing for every Muslim to understand. Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib has said, Two words which can change your life Al Islamu Taslimun. I don't know how more eloquent to put this. Amir al Mu'minin says, The religion of Islam is submission. Religion of Islam is submission. Now, I stay on my stubbornness and I say, no, 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 no. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. That's wrong. That's wrong. I don't like that. I don't like that. Am I submitting? To learn is okay. I, I understand. 
We all go through times when we question and we learn. But now let's say the truth is presented and still we say no because it doesn't suit me and my lifestyle this can't be right. I'm sorry your lifestyle doesn't trump Islam. So Sirat will be very much like the Sirat of this world Siratul Mustaqim. The stations will be many a few of them I will mention with Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They will be the, 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 the station of Wilaya, Sile Rehmi, Namaz, other deeds, how you treated people, parents, all of these things will be asked upon Sirat. Some people will be very quick to cross, some people will be very slow. So in reality what happens is, there are going to be two paths. Some people, one path will go to he heaven, the, for others, they won't even need to go to Sirat in the first place because they have been sorted beforehand straight to hellfire. Quran says, Those who are faithless and do wrong, Allah shall never forgive them, nor shall He guide them to any way except the way to hell. Illa tariqa jahannam. Khalidina fiha abada. They will be in there forever. Yasira. This is indeed very easy for God. So one people will never even see Sirat. They don't need to go there. They go straight to the hellfire. Now, to summarize one of the narrations from Ahlul Bayt, what will be this Sirat? How will it be? So first of all, thinner than a hair. Why thinner than a hair? Why? Tell me. Why does Allah make it like this? Why not make a nice open big road? Why thinner than a hair for God's sake? So, so one more time. Yeah, but why thinner than a hair? Thinner than a hair, sharper than a sword. I'll give you the second part. So number one, it's thin. Number two, it's sharp. Why? To separate right? No, no not necessarily. It, so number one, it's not easy. So to realize it's not easy. Number two, to see your yaqeen. Again, yes, but think about it. Pure people can only pass through, yes. He wants to emphasize the importance, yes. But, li but like I said, yes, difficult. I like this answer. In this world, it's not easy to stay on Sirat. Remember, we are drawing a parallel at every time. All three worlds are interconnected. You'll see parallels between all three. In this world, you tell me, today, Mumbai 2019, whatever life you, whatever life you live, whatever work you're doing, is it easy to be a Mormon? Very hard. Tomorrow we are going to discuss more on this. When we come to discuss drugs, intoxicants, gambling and illicit relationships. Okay? We'll discuss more on this point. But it's not easy. This is the thing. There are some people, they come to me, they come to the alims, they say, we know this is a problem, but how do we do it? How do we come out of it? Now, okay, you can only give so much advice you can only talk so much until a time comes when the person will have to realize that it is them who have to make a choice. Should I do it or should I not? So for example, something which affects many people, I'm sure here, definitely back in my country, there are many careers, many jobs, many things which involve Haram activity. The job itself is not haram, but it involves haram activity. Like what? Maybe you shake hands with a woman, or a sister shakes hands with a man, or you have to hug, or you peck each other on the cheek. Why? It's normal. Or 
you have to go for a drink maybe you don't drink but they drink you have to be with them or there's parties okay over there our equivalent is Christmas parties you must be having other types of parties here if we don't do it we don't get promotion they look at us badly they judge us they think Muslims are all weird how do we get out of this a time comes where no matter how much you say Imam Sadiq and Imam Bakr and Imam Ali and all of these, no matter how much you say Quran says this, that and the other, a time will have to come that the person says, hang on a second, now it's my choice. Should I do it or not? We, we have a saying in English, you can take a horse to water, you can't make it, drink. You can... Alims, parents, elders, whatever, we can do as much as we can, but at the end of the day, the choice is on the individual. Sirat is not easy in this world, it's not easy in the hereafter, because it is very precarious, very easy as a Mormon 2019 to fall off. Very easy. But, and here we have the big grace and the thing that gives us hope inshallah salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad we have hope in three things all interconnected number one mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number two help of the angels sent by allah Number three, support of Ahlul Bayt. Allahumma oh. salam. So we have hope. The picture is not bleak, but we have to discuss this in a bit more depth of what it means to have the support of Ahlul Bayt. What does that mean? So first of all from Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam He says Tajahazu rahimakumullah May Allah have mercy on you provide yourselves for the journey ahead The call for departure has been announced Regard your stay in the world as very short Return to God with the best provision in front of you there is a valley which is very difficult to climb. The place is full of fear and dangers. You have to reach there. You have to stay there. The eyes of death are approaching. It is as if you are already in its talons, claws. And it has struck against you. Difficult affairs and distressing dangers have crushed you. You should therefore cut away all attachment of this world and assist yourselves with the preparation for Allah's fear. Is this easy? I don't think it's easy at all. Living the way we do, living in the time we are, with the wealth we have, with the resources we have, it's not easy to do this. But it's required. It is required. I don't know how else to dress it up for you, but this is what is required. Amirul Mu'minin says you better be ready and cut yourself away from some of these things of the world which are hampering you. More on this, inshallah, tomorrow. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, there is a lot more to discuss which we have not yet reached. But just quickly on the issue of tawassul and intercession of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. This is something that will inshallah, I hope, I hope and I pray that it will come in handy for all of us. But it is especially very, very important for those who are struggling on sirat and struggling on the stations towards heaven. Shafa'a. This is the word we usually use for intercession with Ahlul Bayt. What does it mean? It means very close proximity 
of one thing to another. So when two things come close, shafa'a, shafa'a, this word is used. Very close proximity. Now, this doesn't mean physical proximity because we are not with the masumin. We are in a different time and place. So what we mean is that the closer connection you have, the closer link you have with masumin, the more quick, strong and likely will be your shafa'a. So for example, the Holy Prophet has said that someone who takes prayers lightly will be deprived of my shafa'a. How can this be, Ya Rasulullah? We love you, we come to Medina, we do your ziyarat, we pray salawat on you, we cry over your grandson. No, not enough. You missed one more thing. Namaz was the final piece of the puzzle. You didn't have it. You don't qualify. Don't think it's easy to gain this kind of hope on the Day of Judgment. It's not easy. It requires some very careful steps in this life. Oh Amir al muminin I know in your life you had cut yourself from all worldly pleasures, but I attached myself to all manner of worldly pleasures. Can you come and do my shafaat? What do you think he's going to say? Do I have enough closeness with him in order to rely on his shafaat? He led a life of complete otherworldliness. I'm leading a life of complete worldliness. Surely there may not be enough bond there for me to call upon him or maybe the shafaat will be delayed or weakened these are very sensitive points people don't like to hear them so shafaat it is done with the permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it will who qualifies for it number one those who have a connection with the soul of the infallible the stronger the connection, the sooner the intercession is made and the sooner the salvation is achieved. Number two, some people will therefore never see hell, but other people may only experience shafa'at after a period in hell. We have this as well in our teachings that it could be that some people get it very later. Number three, listen to this. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Indeed, my intercession is for those from my nation who have committed major sins. However, for the righteous, there is no culpability. Why is this? Because... Staying away from major sins erases the minor sins as well. In other words, by the time Qiyamah comes, those minor sins, we don't expect to be there anymore. We expect them to be dealt with in Barzakh. But the major sins is where we'll need the Holy Prophet's help and Ahlul Bayt. Now someone might say, yes, but Molana, we've heard so many hadith. If you cry for Imam Hussein, you will enter heaven. If you cry for Imam Hussein, Janabi Fatima will do shafaat for you. If you do this, that, the other, A, B, C, yes, I agree. And I can tell you, I am equally as emotionally attached to those hadith myself. But we cannot take one hadith and ignore another. We have to take all of the body of information in front of us and then make a sound judgment. So let's say someone is a griever over Imam Hussein, a nazadar of Imam Hussein, shafaat guaranteed. But then he doesn't pray and the Holy Prophet says my shafaat will not reach him. Putting these two together, how will we draw a conclusion? What we'll say is, it could be after a long time, after he has dealt with the issue on the day of judgment of not praying, will the shafaat come? Do you see? So we are not nullifying, we are not voiding any of these great statements that we are very much attached to. No, we are saying yes, we agree, but in its correct context and with all the evidence in front of us, inshallah. We pray to Allah 
that he grants us shafa'at of Ahlul Bayt quickly, timely, properly. But not only that, O oh Allah, make us the type of people that the Masumin, we don't have to call them. Maybe inshallah they will come themselves to do our shafa'at. Maybe they will say, I love this person so much, I'm going to do his shafa'at. This is where we want to be. This brings us to an end of discussions on death and the hereafter. Perhaps we have left out 40% of material. Maybe on another occasion we can cover this. Inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik. Tonight is the remembrance of one of those people who deeply and sincerely loved Aba Abdullah. In fact, his name itself means one who loves. Imam is in Karbala. He has a handful of followers in front of him. The forces are increasing day by day. The numbers are increasing more and more. Janab Zainab comes to Imam Hussein. She says, Brother, we are so few. And in front of us, there are so many. Is there no one else that we can rely on? Is there no one else we can call to our help? Imam says, I cannot think of anyone. Janab Zainab says, I can think of someone. I remember when you were a child and he would see that you have fallen over or something has hurt you. He would come, he would pick you up. He would clean your wound. He would comfort you. That was your childhood friend. Although he was older than you, when you were a child, he would look after you. I remember his name was Habib. Ya Aba Abdullah, call upon your friend Habib. Imam somehow gets a message sent to Kufa. Habib is one of those last few remaining loyal people not to be apprehended. The message reaches Habib that Hussein al Mazloom is calling you to Karbala. Habib looks at his wife. His wife says, You must go. Do not delay. Answer the call of the son of Fatima. He comes, he tells his servant, he says, Prepare my horse. The servant prepares the horse. He tells the servant, Now you are free. He says, My master, but where do you go? He says, I go to Abi Abdullah in Karbala. The servant says, Mola, why do you deprive me? I want to come. Habib says, now you are free. If you wish to come, you come. They arrive in Karbala. Janab Zaina, Bibi Fizza, they are in the tent. They hear a commotion outside. Lots of people are running around speaking. Janab Zainab says, oh, Mother Fizza, see what is happening. She goes, she comes back, she is smiling. She says, Habib is here. Janab Zainab says, send my salams to Habib. When the salam of Zainab reaches Habib, Habib begins to weep. He says, what a time on Ali Muhammad that the daughter of Amirul Mu'mineen is sending me her salams. Habib comes to Imam. Habib says, oh Imam, I'm here for you. Do you allow me to fight on your behalf on the day of Ashura? Imam says, Habib, you are my beloved friend. After a lot of reluctance, Imam lets him go, Habib. Although he is advanced in his years, he is quite old. He begins to fight. Many of the enemies die at the sword of Habib. Habib eventually succumbs to the tiredness, to the heat, to the fatigue. He, he succumbs to all of these things. He is on the floor. He cries out one last time to his friend. Adrikini ya Abba Abdullah. Oh my friend Hussein, come. Imam Hussein rushes to Habib. Imam consoles Habib, he holds Habib in his last moments. What they say is that after Ashura, when Umar Saad orders for all of the heads to be severed from the bodies, one of the heads upon the spear is the head of Habib. And when the spear is brought into Kufa, the son of Habib sees his father's head on the spear and he begins to wail and cry. The forces of Yazid say to him, why are you crying? He says, that is my father's head. 
Give it to me. He is given the head. He takes the head. He gives it a burial. I say to the son of Habib, you are lucky you are given the head of your father. There were other people in the Tarbar of Yazid in Sham. They were not given the head of their father until Sakina had to wail and cry in the Zindan, in the, in the jail. Finally, the head of Hussein is presented to Sakina. And she hugs and cradles the head. And what does she say? She says, Baba, I have two questions. Number one, Baba, how come I am an orphan? Where did you go, Baba? Number two, Baba, where is my brother, Ali Yonilaskar? I am missing him. Allah, Allah, not Allah, he'll come in the Alameen, was a Lamuladina Zalamu, a Yamun Kalibi and Kalibun. Let us remember all Marhumin Rahmallahu Mankara Al Fatiha.